Good morning, everyone. I would just like to receive a quick confirmation if you can see the slides. If they're visible for you. Thank you very much, Farah. Uh, so good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, depending uh, on where you are watching us from on behalf of the International Pharmaceutical Federation and Global, Global Pharmaceutical Observatory. I extend a warm welcome to everyone, to those who joined live to and to those who will, watching, who will be watching us later. We are pleased to be delivering this regional dig digital event as a part of FIPJPO program entitled How Can Digital Help Support National Pharmaceutical Care Delivery? A regional and a global assessment of priorities and challenges regionally and globally. This is a series of six regional events, and this is the first regional event. Um, so quickly introducing myself, my name is Natalia Skura. I am from Poland and I am FIP YPG Early Career Regional Supporter. I will be co-moderating co this session together with Professor Ian Bates. He is the director of FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory. Uh, Professor A.B., uh, would, you, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning and to introduce shortly our esteemed uh, panel of experts um, from around uh, Europe who will be helping us to address some of these critical issues for pharmaceutical service delivery. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the session, let me share some announcements with you. Uh, the webinar is going to be recorded and is live streamed via YouTube, uh, and then the recording will be available on our website, which is events.fip.org. You may ask questions using the question box provided, uh, and you are welcome to provide your feedback at webinar at fip.org. And if you're not already a member at FIP, I welcome you to register using our webpage. You will be receiving the certificate uh, of attendance from FIP after the event. We would also like to thank Pfizer and F Partner for Better for supporting this program through unrestricted funds. I will hand over to Farah to give an introduction about the FIP Global uh, Pharmaceutical Observatory. Um, but before I do that, I would also like to acknowledge the support of my colleague Ozgan, uh, from who is also FIP YPG Early Career Supporter. Uh, and as well, uh, the work of the FIP Global Observatory team responsible for the management of this program. He's also here in the meeting. Um, so from our team, we have Professor Jan Bates, FIP GPO Director, Christopher John, Farah, Shirley. Um, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your names incorrectly, uh, but it's uh, Shelley Meilanti, Dalia Konmadi, and Afina Fayouziach. And right now I'm going to hand over to Farah. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, so my name is Farah Haqqad. I'm FIP's Region Engagement Support and Development Manager. And I've been introduced earlier by Natalia, so I think we can move forward. Uh, in my brief presentation, I will give you a brief overview about the FIP GPO, Global Pharmaceutical Observatory, which is basically the engine room of the Global Pharmaceutical Data Collection. So the FIP GPO will uh, measure and monitor progress towards the FIP development goals, the DGs. Our mission is centered around data, intelligence, advocacy, and reporting. The four circles on the slides. We know the importance of data and uh, for data to provide us with the evidence which demonstrates impact. So our first task is to collate valid global data on workforce education, practice, and pharmaceutical science. We must undertake a comprehensive analysis of the collated data to provide accessible, high quality intelligence. And all of this must be communicated innovatively to promote our member organizations impact on health. And on the screen, you can see some of the programs of work for the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory. We will continue to take a tested needs-based approach to address data and the FIPDGs challenges through the development of inclusive multinational needs assessment programs, MNAP. And today's event is part of this program. Today's event is primarily aligned to one of our FIPDGs, DG20, Digital Health. 
Other areas of work include the FIP GPO Atlas, which is a platform for showcasing our members' needs and priorities, uh, supported, of course, by the data from the GPO. It allows FIP to identify opportunities for developing pharmacy with, for, and through our member organizations. We have the GPO database, which, which is a repository for FIP's pharmacy and pharmaceutical science data. It contains all of the data that informs the indicators used to track progress against the FIP DGs. And the FIP development goals provides the framework for the needs assessments and prioritizations uh, for our member organizations to undertake. Um, and it is relevant to uh, their national situation. Uh, the priorities can provide each organization with the foundation for mapping the progress and transformations for their workforce practice and pharmaceutical science, as we mentioned. The indicators work uh, will be a way to measure and monitor the progress and transformations um, for our member organizations. The commission uh, provides strategic advice to FIP on the advocacy and delivery of the Global Pharmaceutical Observatory project. Uh, focusing on achievements of the vision and the strategic objectives through member engagement. If we can go next, Natalia. If you have uh, any inquiries and for more information about the GPO, please visit our webpage by clicking on the link that I will share in the chat box or by scanning the QR code on the screen. You can also contact us at observatory at fip.org. I think this concludes my presentation. I will hand it over to Professor Ian to give you an introduction about this program. Professor Ian, over to you. Thank you, Farah, and uh, also Natalia from, uh, for your introductions. Uh, we'll be coming back to um, Natalia uh, shortly, who will be conducting uh, one, one of our uh, engagement exercises today, so that everyone has an opportunity of providing some input uh, into today's discussions. So about two years ago, we, uh, we tested out something called uh, uh, the Multinational uh, Education and Training Needs Assessment, or METNA. And this was a regionally based um, program to start to collect priorities from countries, uh, leadership organizations and federations um, about what education and training needs uh, for the future might, might be. And that proved, proved to be such a successful um, pilot, if you like, that it quickly metamorphosized into something we're now calling the Multinational Needs Assessment Programme with a wider scope, more than, more than just education and training. And one of the predominant themes which emerged from our pilot work was, of course, about digital health, digitization which you, you don't need me to tell you, is becoming an increasingly important facet of healthcare delivery and indeed pharmaceutical healthcare delivery. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a focus for us for today's webinar. The second focus, because we're trying to do two things at once here to be efficient, is the continuing problem of substandard and falsified medicines and how digital uh, technology can assist us with that. So we, we're doing two things at once. Um, and we've already had two very successful engagement meetings um, with our African regional uh, colleagues and our Eastern Mediterranean colleagues. And as you can see from the diagram there, we've got our other uh, regional engagement uh, uh, webinars coming up, of which uh, this is one, of course, focusing on our European um, partners and leadership bodies uh, within Europe. Thank you for that. Uh, so let's move, the, so that's the backdrop of what we're doing today. Let's move on to our first um, theme. Uh, and I think the next slide just shows us a, a, actually a general overview of where we're going with the webinar today. Yes, that's right. So uh, we're setting the scene just now. Theme one is coming up. Which is about uh, which is the first half of this webinar on digital health or digital mechanisms, digital applications, innovations to support medication adherence. And all of us, I think, are well versed in 
the importance of medication adherence for better clinical therapeutic outcomes. Um, and we are uh, very fortunate indeed to have some uh, world-renowned speakers on the panel uh, for this topic uh, to begin our webinar with. And I'm going to um, uh, introduce you to our panel of speakers uh, very shortly. Uh, there will be an engagement activity after that, and then part two of our webinar this morning will be some short presentations about uh, digital uh, aspects, solutions to uh, substandard and falsified medicines. Let's crack on with theme one, which is uh, medication adherence, which we are all concerned about and concerned with. And we have a uh, super panel for you this morning. Let me quickly introduce you to uh, Anna Lise Hartner, who is the director of eHealth for the Norwegian Pharmacy Association. It's a great honor to have you with us today, Annalise. Thank you so much. We have uh, Andras uh, Sula, who is the president of the European Association of Hospital Pharmacists. Again, a great privilege to have you with us, uh, Andras. Thank you. Thank for you, Ian. Good afternoon to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, Ilaria. Uh, Passarani, who is Secretary General of the PGEU, the Pharmaceutical Group of the European Union. It's fantastic to have you with us this morning, uh, Ilaria. Thank you very much for giving up uh, your time and your wisdom uh, to this panel. Uh, Thanks to you for the invitation. Last but by no means least, we have uh, Nicolette uh, Bartolo, who is a, a lecturer, an expert lecturer, uh, from uh, who is representing today the Malta Pharmaceutical Association based at the University of Malta. Thank you very much, Nicolette, for being with us this morning. Thank you, Ian, for the invitation. So I've got a series of exam questions for you uh, to answer this morning. Um, I think what we'll do is go around our panel and, and get a country and a professional leadership organizational view of in innovations, first of all, um, applications or interventions that you'd like to highlight for us on this topic of um, medication adherence. So we're sort of collecting in some examples of best practice or examples of innovation now for digital um, applications that facilitate medication uh, adherence as part of our pharmaceutical care services. So uh, let me go down my uh, list and I'm going to ask uh, in order now, Anne Lies from Norway, uh, from the Norwegian Pharmacy Association uh, as director of eHealth, maybe to outline um, um, some current innovations that your uh, leadership body has been engaged with. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to share with you how we use, utilize uh, digital health technology to support medication adherence in Norway. Uh, the Norwegian Pharmacy Association has been and still is responsible for the development and administration of a national digital pharmacy management system, which is currently used by all Norwegian pharmacies and internet pharmacies. And we are also responsible for taking care of the pharmacy's interests in government's development of technology and e-health services. Uh, so as a representative from the Norwegian Pharmacy Association, I have therefore focused on the digital solutions we are responsible for uh, and on the national solutions the pharmacies are or will be using to promote pharmaceutical care services, which facilitates medication adherence. Uh, first of all, Norwegian pharmacies have a long tradition of cooperating professionally, as well as respect to item system development. Since um, the introduction of digital pharmacy systems, all Norwegian pharmacies has, have always uh, used the same system, uh, currently called PharmaPro. PharmaPro ensures digital handling, reimbursement, and documentation of prescriptions and pharmaceutical services, and is a digital system for invoicing and inventory management. 
in addition to providing professional and economic uh, reports for each pharmacy pharmapro is also used to provide various national statistics um, pharmapro is an old system built on own old technology and there was a need for a new system that better supported the pharmacy's mission the Norwegian Pharmacy Association has now uh, created a new national pharmacy system called Ike. Ike will, together with the pharmacy's own business systems, replace today's system Pharmapro and will, for the first time, provide a shared pa patient health record among the pharmacies. Ike is a platform or a core system, so all pharmacies or pharmacy chains develop their own user solution or business system with an interface to Ike. This is an important prerequisite for being able to adapt to digital development. Ike will facilitate communication with public systems and registers, as well as improve digital interaction between pharmacies. With Ike, the information will be following the patient and pharmacy employees can use the information as a basis for health care across the pharmacies. In this way, patients will be able to uh, receive equal pharmaceutical care regardless of which pharmacy they visit. The new system will be developed or deployed to the pharmacies during late 2023. Uh, Ike will support pharmacies' mission, like increase patient safety by helping pharmacy customers use their medication correctly, facilitate standardization of processes and services in and between pharmacies, facilitate effective collaboration between pharmacies and other actors in the health service, and facilitate digital and technological uh, innovation and specialization among the various pharmacy, pharmacy players. An example, uh, AIC will make it possible to review a patient's filling of prescriptions across pharmacies. This increases the possibility of identifying patients with poor adherence and initiate pharmaceutical care services. In Norway, it is a national obje objective to make patients' information available across healthcare providers. Other actors in the health service in Norway are now working to develop similar solutions. And Norway has also had a national solution for e-prescription or electronic prescriptions since 2012. Uh, a new national solution is also under development called the patient's medication list. And the main objective of the solution is for all healthcare personnel to have access to one national digital list of the medicines the patient is using, updated at all time. The Pharmacy Association is currently investigating how we will make use of this list and which new services it may facilitate. Now we also had, have a digital solution for unit dose or dose dispensed medicine uh, offered from the community pharmacies. Uh, this is under development and national implementation in Norway. So I think that was uh, the most important solutions uh, we are um, we are um, working with. Thank you. Thank thank you very much for that. I, I just one little quick question before I move on to uh, Andras for his um, uh, examples, and that is who, who funds uh, that system, the I Ike system? You called it. Who, who? Um, Partly from uh, the actors or yeah, the pharmacy chains and the pharmacies and partly from the Norwegian Pharmacy Association. That's amazing. Is there any government support for this at all? Central government support? No, I'm afraid it's not. Hmm. Okay. We may come back to this question of funding uh, because of course that's critically important for primary care, primary care delivery. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. But in the meantime, let's move on to Andras, uh, president of the uh, EAHP. So this is now much more of an acute sector, a secondary care sector perspective, I suspect, coming from Andras. So innovations, applications, novelties, Andras. What about you? Well, thank you, Ian. Uh, again, good afternoon to all of you and all the attendees. 
Um, from the hospital uh, pharmacy point of view, uh, we kind of have a tiny bit different perspective or viewpoint on, uh, on patient care and also how pharmaceutical care is delivered. And when we talk about this uh, rather huge topic, we tend to think that uh, basically pharmaceutical care uh, is, from our perspective, a little bit more than uh, ensuring the therapeutic adherence of patients. Because uh, uh, from how we see that uh, patient adherence and ensuring patient adherence from the pharmacist's point of view, is uh, mostly focusing on the execution and the proper execution of therapies. Whereas uh, we would uh, like to think, and we are kind of uh, fighting for that as well, uh, uh, to include the pharmacist's expertise when uh, the actual therapeutic decisions are constructed and made. So uh, we would uh, usually say that uh, pharmaceutical care is kind of a broader uh, thing from the hospital pharmacy point of view, may mainly including the therapeutic management aspect as well. So from this point of view, uh, digitization and, and all the electronic tools have uh, a huge boom uh, uh, as we speak, basically. And these past couple of years have shown that um, electronic health records uh, and also the electronic prescription systems have a huge asset towards hospital pharmacy and how clinical pharmacy services can be delivered on patient wards. Um, Talking about the electronic health records, we are seeing a rather diverse picture on the European scene, uh, which is uh, more or less not surprising, I would say. Uh, but uh, any incarnation of an EHR system has the potential to provide a tool uh, to serve as an oversight for patient care and how therapeutic decisions are made and those decisions and the information about those decisions are fluidly transferred between different parts of a single health system or different levels of uh, a national healthcare system, for example. Um, electronic health records and uh, all the electronic patient documentation within hospitals is also a great tool to eliminate the so-called physical paper trail. And uh, that has a huge potential in terms of minimizing the risk of transcription steps for documentation uh, within hospitals. And as we see from previous studies, uh, those uh, physical paper-based transcription steps have uh, a rather major uh, potential or risk for, uh, for medication-related errors uh, within, uh, within the hospital sector. So uh, from this perspective, we are hugely determined that uh, electronic health record is the way to go for the hospital uh, sector as is, and also for the hospital pharmacist. For this, but I guess we will get back to this a little bit later, it is of course imperative that all clinical pharmacists who have practices within the frontline healthcare teams have access to these electronic health records and preferably not only a read-only one, but uh, a bi-directional uh, access so that all the pharmaceutical um, revisions or opinions or even therapeutic decisions by clinical pharmacists can be recorded in those systems. This has a branching off towards uh, electronic uh, prescription systems for uh, different countries, and those are usually national or large region-based uh, electronic uh, prescription systems. Of course, when we discharge patients from the hospitals, it is um, a really a convenient way to transfer the therapeutic decisions that has that have occurred within hospitals to the e-prescription systems. Uh, and in that way, we can also eliminate the transcription uh, phase when the patient moves be between levels of health system, healthcare systems uh, in countries. And this way we can also open up 
the communication between uh, hospital pharmacy and the retail and community pharmacy sector. And this uh, so-called interface pharmacy, I think, has a, an enormous uh, potential for the future. And I have a feeling that it is a little bit underdeveloped at, at, at this very moment. But for the continuity of pharmaceutical care and the continuity of pharmacy-based uh, or pharmacist-based therapeutic management, uh, it is imperative that this interface is catered for and, and, and that therapeutic information can follow the patient wherever they go. Uh, and last but not least, I would like to highlight the importance of, of pharmacy-based automation within the hospital setting. Uh, and Annalise uh, has also hinted on uh, patient dosing mechanisms. And we also within hospitals use different unit dosing or daily do dosing machinery. And those automation solutions have a great potential of eliminating dispensing errors. So um, we can certainly look at a very comprehensive system where therapeutic decisions are uh, overseen by pharmacists and the decisions and all the relevant documentation are uh, the documentation is set within the electronic health record and then as the next logical step the medication dispensing itself is secured via digitization and automation because those machines with visual control built in them and the different um, per patient um, appropriation of medication doses like using data matrix codes or rfid uh, authentication uh, can ensure that not only the therapeutic decision is right, but also the right medication is dispensed to the right patients with all the R's uh, checked uh, in, in this uh, quality insurance system. So it can be a hugely round and, and complete system to which the output, the patient, when, when the patient gets uh, discharged from, from the hospital, can also be secured via the e-prescription system, which then can hand off or hand over the patient to our dear colleagues uh, within the community pharmacy sector. So that's that's it in a nutshell. Thank you, and Andres. That was uh, consummately done, uh, that summary. And you raised some really important um, points there, particularly the interfacial points, the transfer of care across um, components or sectors within the healthcare system. It's becoming critically important now. And the corollary of that is this notion of integrated care, which is emerging in, in many countries now, is something we, I think, as a profession, really need to take notice of. And note a, a note for FIP here, is we need to focus more on this uh, integrated care uh, approach. I think it's a corollary of the pharmaceutical care philosophy that's emerged, but it really does need tackling uh, right now. Thank you so much for that, Andres. That was Thank you. super. Same theme then. So we've, uh, we're have we looking at innovation and mechanisms and applications for helping to address uh, medication adherence. And it's a real pleasure to have the PG EU, um, a hugely influential and important uh, leadership group within uh, Europe. Um, and uh, Ilaria uh, Passarani, who is Secretary General of the PG EU. Um, Ilaria, uh, over, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. Once again, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, many are the, the ongoing initiatives across Europe. Uh, to facilitate medication adherence that use digital tools. And I would like to briefly share with you today three examples, starting with Denmark. Uh, so the Danish pharmacies app, which is called Apotheket, uh, makes life a little bit easier for patients under regular medical treatment for from birth control pills users to chronically ill patients because it brings all the information about their medicines together. And this app is connected to all the relevant system in Denmark, so the shared medicines card, and also the pharmacy's storage systems. So among other things, in this app, patients can repeat prescription 
see the reimbursement status and the price of the medicine, establish a fixed medicines order, and also be assisted in the appropriate use of the medicines. Most importantly, the hub improves adherence and compliance because medicines users are reminder are reminded when it's time to renew a, prescrip a prescription, uh, the time to fetch their medicines or choose who, who, where they want it to, to be delivered. They can also choose a fixed order at the pharmacy and then it takes place automatically. In addition, they can also set the app medicines reminder to let them know when it's time to take their medicine. So it's really important uh, tool to improve adherence. Uh, Apotheket, I apologize for the pronunciation for, for people joining from Denmark. It's also a shared website, uh, which is owned by Danish pharmacists, and their patients can find information on health and illnesses in general. They can find advice on safe care, and they can chat with the pharmacy uh, day and night. The service is free of charge, it's open for all, and they tell me that the response time is very fast. Another example from Portugal, the app Farmacias Portuguesas provide information concerning medicines and health management, including therapeutic reminders, following the, the creation from the pharmacist of a certified treatment plan, which is integrated in the app. And in particular, this app includes a field reminder that creates a plan for medication intake for the user or also a family member, which controls the frequency, the amount, and the time of the next intake. There is also a personal area with the record of the user's biometric and clinical parameters, such as the body mass index, weight measurement, blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose levels, all of this being evaluated in the app and alerting the user for any value out of the standard range that requires further attention. Last example, very briefly in, 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 briefly, in Austria, they have a free of charge mobile app, which has been downloaded more than 400,000 times to, to date. And it has been decided to help patients in organizing their medication. So it's a self-updating app, which is also accessible to users with disability. And it includes, among other things, a pharmacy locator, a medication guide, a medication organizer, a vaccine schedule, for example, but also pharmacy news. The medication organizer, and I would focus on that because we're speaking about adherence, uh, includes a diary, an alarm, and a reminder functions, which allow the patient to keep track of, of their medication and conditions and determine also the compatibility between the current and the newly prescribed medication. This function also enables the users to set reminders for multiple medications. The vaccine schedule reminder function also has an electronic vaccination certificate to save the vaccination date. It provides reminders on routine vaccination and also very brief catch-up recommendations. Uh, so these are great examples that I wanted to share with you today, coming from our members that adds to uh, the Swedish experience. So, sorry, you caught me with my mute button on. It, it has to happen once in every presentation. But, uh, I forget to do that. Thank you very much. Can, can I ask um, maybe just a very brief question? You have, um, a, you have a lot of uh, connections and influence with the uh, Commission, European Commission, of course. Do you think that the politicians are fully aware of how important medication adherence is, just from a, a health care systems outcomes point of view? Do you think they're on the ball with it? Politicians uh, in Brussels are very enthusiastic about digital tools. They are very enthusiastic about big data, artificial intelligence. In uh, May, the European Commission published uh, a proposal for a regulation on, uh, which is providing a European health data space to share uh, health data. So they're very enthusiastic about the idea of the use of digital tools, the idea of promoting interoperability, but they often miss the link between the digital tools and the real life of patients and of pharmacy daily practice. And we are there to make sure that they become aware of this link and of the implications of digital tools uh, for the general public, for pharmacists, uh, and also about the importance of still maintaining um, the face-to-face um, -face, uh, connection uh, between uh, the pharmacists and the patient, between healthcare providers in general and patients. So digital tools integrated in um, primary healthcare uh, from a wider perspective. Thank you for that. It does illustrate, I think, just how important leadership is from the federations, people like EAHP and you know PGEU, but also the individual national leadership bodies 
um, uh, like Norway, like Norway, for example, with uh, Annalise with us. Um, and it's another national leadership body that we turn to right now um, with uh, Dr. Uh, Nicolette uh, Bartolo, who's a, a, a lecturer at the University of Malta, but also representing the Malta Pharmaceutical Association. Be before I let uh, Nicoletta uh, loose on you, could I ask my panel colleagues just to have a quick look through the chat box and the Q&A boxes to see if there's any um, questions you could uh, uh, answer for us. Is, uh, we've got a huge audience um, on the webinar this morning and a lot of comments and questions coming in. So that would be really uh, great to have that interaction with our audience today. Um, Dr. Nicoletta, let's hand over to you. Thank you. So in Malta, there are various um, applications of uh, digital health uh, within the pharmaceutical care services. And one of the examples is the use of robots for the automated preparation of medicines, as Andras was describing before. And it was also observed that during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was an, an accelerated shift towards digitalization of services. Um, such as by, um, by the introduction of telemedicine um, locally to also meet the, the requirements of, of, of the period of the, due to the restrictions implemented. With respect to the application of digital health um, for the improvement in medication adherence, in Malta there isn't yet a national strategy in place. However, we are still observing the application of digital health um, to improve adherence uh, applied on an individualized basis. Um, some examples include that pharmacies are taking the initiative um, to implement these um, digital health related measures uh, which address compliance issues by, for example, sending a message to patients to via SMS to inform them that they are due to order a refill or else to collect the free medications which are provided through the national health system. And the move towards digitalization is not only applied, is not only being applied by healthcare professionals, but we are also seeing this um, move being employed and implemented by the patients themselves, whereby we have patients who are using their mobile phone to help them remember taking medicines, such as by setting alarms at different intervals um, according to the need um, when, when they have to take their medication, or else by downloading the appropriate mobile applications on their smartphone, which serves um, to remind them that they need to take their medication. So with respect to um, digital applications and uh, technologies uh, related to uh, medication adherence, those are the main examples um, in, from our scenario. That's super. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolette. So we've, we've had a, 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 a wide range of uh, initiatives um, described by our panelists, which have encompassed all uh, sectors of uh, pharmaceutical care, pharmaceutical services uh, delivery. I'm wondering if um, we should have a, a few minutes talking about some of the maybe more acute barriers and challenges to developing further digital related health solutions for this big clinical problem, which is medicines and hearing. And as you all come from different sectors and you're representing different, um, if you like, work groups within pharmacy, I'm really interested to hear what your uh, appreciation of these barriers and challenges might be. I'm going to ask you to be very brief, maybe list out one or two primary or chief barriers you think are getting in the way of further rollout of these solutions from your own perspectives as uh, both your leadership organizations and your um, uh, pharmaceutical sector as well. I'll head back towards um, Norway, I think, first of all, with uh, Anna Lees and, and ask for your synopsis on what are the chief barriers that you're seeing 
uh, with your work in digitizing adherence support. Thank you, Ian. Uh, uh, I think there are barrier, barrier, uh, barriers, both legal, financial, technological, governance-wise, competence-wise, and resource-wise. But I think the most important ones uh, may be the legal-wise and the financial-wise. And when it comes to the legal-wise, uh, our experience is that um, uh, in Norway, the focus is mainly on the prescribers when the regulations related to use of national solutions are developed. And it's also a great focus on privacy and information security, of course, GDPR. And there is always a discussion with, uh, or uh, related to the balance between patient safety and privacy. Um, and I think also it, it is... Um, a challenge that laws and regulations are not sufficiently adapted to the development and use of digital solutions is always behind so so you have to work with it uh, or or the development is pushing uh, or the technological development is pushing the development of new new uh, regulations and laws um, and when it comes to the financial barriers uh, in terms of experience again, uh, the government uh, are taking responsibility for developing and financing solutions and functionalities for prescribers, while pharmacies have to develop and finance solutions, functionality and integrations towards national solutions themselves. And in Norway, a law has now been passed which stipulates that actors in the health service must pay for the use of national e-health solutions. Uh, and that comes on the top of our own development. Um, and for pharmacies, this means uh, an additional cost element that is not compensated through the drug uh, markup, which is regulated by the, the authorities. So I guess those are um, uh, the the largest barriers uh, uh, in uh, in digitalization. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's uh, super to hear that. I tell you, I'm going to draw a line directly to uh, Andras uh, right now on this, particularly with your bringing up this notion of of the the legal elements. And Andras talked um, uh, but very uh, um, eloquently about shared records, the electronic records and patient records being accessible. Do you want to talk from your point of view briefly about the barriers that you see about rolling this out more generally, particularly from you know, the acute sector? Yes, uh, very much in addition to what Annelise uh, had already mentioned in terms of data protection and data privacy and patient rights uh, or legal framework angle, uh, uh, we also kind of face two aspects of barriers, uh, basically stemming from, from a very common root of, uh, of uh, being a little bit too colorful in terms of how, how diverse uh, electronic health implementation is within different regions in the European Union. But uh, one aspect of those differences or, or diversities is a technical one. And I just uh, saw a question regarding this uh, within the Q&A window. And yes, most definitely, these EHR systems do need a common language, a lingua franca, so to say. Um, and we, ha we have seen some major hurdles in this regard, uh, not only between countries but within countries also different hospitals using different systems different pharmacies using different systems that do not talk to each other or do not understand when they talk to each other so yes a common interface or a common um, language um, and data structure is most definitely needed and that is a very technical aspect but a hugely important one the other aspect is an operational one, uh, and that I also touched upon previously. It's, it's a question of how do pharmacists access these systems, also the prescription system, the electronic health record, and also automation. Uh, and if they do have access to those systems, what rights do pharmacists have in terms of therapeutic decision making, 
or modifying therapies or merely just executing them, meaning filling prescriptions. And last but not least, to keep it brief, uh, I would also again like to highlight the interfacing problem here, all the inter integrative uh, approach towards uh, multi-tiered healthcare systems. Um, it is imperative that the so-called cognitive pharmacy services are delivered also on the primary care level and the secondary and tertiary healthcare levels. If that is delivered uh, within collaborative GP practices, or we call them uh, pharmacy-based pharmaceutical care, uh, it's basically all the same. Uh, the main question is that there is a recipient for handing off the patients from uh, the hospitals, because if there is none, the information has a huge uh, risk that it will get distorted or lost completely. So um, that 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 would be the gist of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, excellent points, Andres. I have to say, um, and I. Uh, uh agree that there is also a, a, a common lingua franca about competences and skills that we need across all sectors as well in order to develop this. It's something I'm particularly passionate about. So from Central Europe, let's head to the beautiful South and ask uh, Nicoletta. Nicolette, you, your um, uh, talk with others later on was very much focused on practical issues for patients and uh, such like. But what, what do you see as a, a, a principal barriers for rolling out more digital support for adherence? Yes, if we take um, in, in perspective the point of view of patients, I think one of the main barriers can be digital literacy. That is a large proportion of the patient population which I think would benefit the most from the use of uh, um, digital applications for medication adherence are, is the elderly population. And uh, they, the elderly may find it difficult to learn how to use certain new technologies, maybe due to inexperience in the use of technology, or else it could also be due to a lack of technical skills. And also, although um, some elderly might also be tech savvy, it can also still prove to be challenging for them to use new technologies, especially when they are in poor health or also have um, cognitive decline. So um, that is one of the barriers uh, related to the patient perspective. Another barrier which uh, um, is also in place is cost. So previously we discussed cost in terms from the um, governmental point of view, but we should also take into consideration the means of patients, whether they afford um, to buy certain technologies to, uh, to, uh, to be able to improve the medication adherence. Um, we have individuals from a certain socioeconomic sector um, which have a low income or as they are unemployed and they cannot afford to acquire um, technology such as a smartphone. Although nowadays smartphone might be freely available, not everyone can afford them. So we have to keep that in mind, especially when developing um, the applications or as enrolling a national program with respect to medication adherence. And apart from costs related to buying the actual technology, we should also keep in mind um, costs related to supporting services, such as whether um, the patients are able to afford paying for the internet service, um, to, to be able to use such technologies and also to uh, be in communication also with healthcare professionals. So, we should ensure that there is digital equity um, uh, from this point of view, that if we are going to introduce such technologies, we have to make sure that the technologies being implemented are affordable by everyone. Otherwise, we risk having a chunk of the population which misses out on such an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a really important point, I think. Um, many of the most digitally adept people are not the people who are very ill uh, or taking uh, a lot of medicines. And that's something uh, that's really pleased you brought that up, Nicola. 
So and finally, before we have a, an engagement um, uh, activity exercise, uh, let's head over to the political centre of Europe. Could I call it that in Brussels and bring in uh, Il Ilaria for perhaps a, a bit of an overview of, of uh, where you see your your organisation, where, where you see some of the barriers that um, perhaps haven't been covered by our other speakers. Yes, indeed, I can only echo what has been said. So I see three major barriers. The lack of uh, an approved regulatory framework, the lack of financial support, and the lack of interoperability. With regard to the regulatory framework, in Europe we have a multitude of legislation uh, which have an impact on digital health, uh, from the general data protection regulation, which cover aspects related to patient uh, data, so confidentiality, uh, which aim to uh, harmonize the legislation in Europe, but it's very difficult to implement it in practice. From the from both the healthcare directive to the medical devices regulation from the Digital Services Act, the newly adopted EU health data space, we see that, as Annalise said, that the regulatory framework struggles to keep the pace of technological development, so it's, no, it's not future proof. And also it is inconsistent. So there are also some inconsistency in definitions within the EU legislation. And this, of course, pose a lot of problems in the implementation at national level and create confusion and therefore barriers and obstacles to, the, 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 to exploiting the full benefits of digital solution. With regard to the lack of financing, I think we as a pharmacist organization, we have to make an additional effort to quantify from an economic point of view, the benefits of investing in digital solution and in the benefits that they can bring, for example, in relation to medication adherence and reducing medication error. And the third point is interoperability, because as Andras was saying, uh, in Europe, there are uh, many fragmented solutions uh, at regional level, national level, at European level, but barriers uh, in terms of interoperability exist also between healthcare professionals. And one of the biggest benefits of digital health is to promote a multi-professional collaboration, uh, seamless care for patients. And we see that pharmacists still have troubles in, for example, accessing the medication uh, uh, health record and let, let alone the health record of patients. And of course, these are practical barriers uh, that we need to overcome to exploit the potential of digital health solutions. Super good, uh, super good. You were getting a lot of nods from your uh, panelist colleagues then, uh, Ilari, with your summary. Thank you very much for that. Thank you all very much for that. We're going to move on to a to a, a short engagement with our audience um, today who have joined us, and I'm going to uh, pass on to Natalia, who's going to run this uh, very quick um, engagement activity. Over to you, Natalia. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, let me just share my screen very quickly. We are right now moving to the engagement activity. Uh, as you can see, you have a pop-up on your screen, which is a question. The question says, in your opinion, what is the main challenge to implementing digital health in pharmaceutical care services? Uh, we are asking you to choose your top three options that you think are the most accurate answer to that question. First being lack of uh, regulatory models, policies, and strategies, as in lack of regulations to ensure safe and effective use of digital health. Your second option is economical and finance, financial concerns because cost of digital health implementation is high. Third is patient confidentiality risks and safety. And this is the risk regarding patient uh, infosecurity, Fourth option you can click is variable technology literacy and accessibility in the community. As we know that um, the use and access to technology varies. Um, next one is lack of professional learning um, and training for pharmacists in digital health, meaning lack of professional learning development. Sixth option is uh, lack of evaluation mechanism and monitoring of digital services, meaning lack of monitoring tools and a mechanism to evaluate the use of digital health and its effects. And the last option that you can choose is lack of interoperability uh, of systems, um, meaning that fragmented systems and no collaboration with other systems that might be a problem in implementing the digital health. So please uh, choose your three best options and we are waiting for your answers.
and we already have the results of the poll. I think you can see them on the screen. Thank you very much for your engagement. Now we are going to move to the theme uh, two. Second, which is digital health to fight substandard and falsified medicines. And I am handing over to Professor uh, IB. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Um, it's time to introduce you all to uh, some new faces on our uh, webinar um, for some short presentations about uh, the fight against substandard and falsified medicines. This is at the the, the root, the very core of our professional identities, I think, um, medicines and the quality of medicines. Um, and, um, you know, ranging from criminal activity all the way through to uh, poor manufacturing is a, is a huge uh, scope and range of uh, uh, challenge. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce, first of all, uh, Professor Anthony uh, Saratino. England, who is the president of the uh, Malta Pharmaceutical Association and uh, a very eminent professor at the University of Malta. Uh, Anthony and I have known each other for a long time. I do believe you might be wearing my tie, Anthony. Is that correct? Uh, not today, but not today. quite often. <laughs> That there is a story which I'll tell you all when we meet in person at some point. But at the moment, <laughs> uh, over to Anthony. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Pro uh, Professor Bates, for um, that uh, introduction. We really have been uh, good. We really have been good friends for. Shame. Shanti has it. Okay, we have. We, we really have been good friends for, for a long time. And um, just to introduce uh, this subject of, of digital health, if you, we have heard a lot about, about the adherence and the important uh, functions that the pharmacist could do, especially in, in more recent developments in, in pharmaceutical care and uh, clinical pharmacy, but all these would serve, uh, would not serve their purpose if we do not uh, provide one of the first rights that we need to give to our patients, and namely that right to give a quality medicine, the right and the quality medicine to the patient. Now, a medicine uh, would be of the, of the right quality, of course, if it is not a st substandard medicine or, or, or a falsified medicine. And today we have even extended the definition of, of what we mean by falsified medicines. During my, my younger time, we used to think of a falsified medicine and equate it with a fake medicine. But today, that definition has been expanded to include also medicines that have not followed the correct regulatory pathway throughout from the time of manufacturer to death of delivery of dispensing to the patient. And that uh, brings us that today it's not only the, the criminal action of producing a, a falsified medicine, which of course remains the most serious part in, in, in falsified medicines. But we also look at the question of having a substandard medicine, a substandard medicine that could result as effect from the, for example, wrong distribution, the wrong temperature, the stability problems that could arise from the time that the product leaves the manufacturer until it reaches the patient. And the pharmacist today is contributing, contributing very well to this, uh, to ensuring that the, the, this factor of having a good quality medicine, of having the right medicine delivered to, to, to the patient qualifies as one of the a major thing that contributes to the three pillars of regulating 
a pharmacy delivery of the regulatory sciences, namely quality, safety, and efficacy. And falsified medicines and substandard medicines hit each and every one of those triplers. If there is an epitome that happened in the European Union relatively recently is the introduction of the falsified medicines uh, directive, which include mainly two major aspects. One is the unique identifier, and the other second aspect is the requirement for a tamper proof. Now, the unique identifier has probably taken advantage of the most advanced ways of digitalization. And that ensures from the time of manufacturer till the time that the product is delivered to the patient, that it is an authentic product. The tamper proof requirement perhaps has not been so much digitalized. It is still quite a mechanical action that is taken to ensure that the product is authentic, that is reaching the patient. And I would predict that not in the very far future, the way how we do tamper proofing today would be researched much further that it will also become a digitalized uh, process. But we'll, I will not dwell too much on this uh, falsified medicines directive, which could be considered as an, a, a, an epitome in, in the European Union, uh, because uh, I have seen that uh, the, the next speakers will also dwell in better detail on this aspect of reaching uh, the ability to be able to detect, to be able to identify, and to be able to report falsified medicines. We cannot consider that in the European Union, now we have reached and solved completely this problem of falsified medicines and substandard medicines. And the reason for that is that the directive still does not include, for example, products that are non-prescription products. And those are also close to the heart of the pharmacist's work. We also have not very well included how to be careful about possible products that are obtained, for example, through the internet. There are still a number of challenges and a number of directions that we could see in this uh, next slide. And here we see some of the barriers and challenges that each and one of us meet in ensuring in this fight towards substandard and for so avoiding the substandard and falsified methods. And one of the features that has been already referred to in the in, in which is a feature probably that accompanies any aspects that we talk about and we heard about it in the in the previous uh, uh, talk up, talks about uh, and uh, contributions about adherence for example but we still here meet the question of economics because these features these contributions towards fighting substandard and falsified medicines are not something that is done for free. Probably nothing is for free, but these are rather expensive procedures, expensive both in time and expensive also in getting the apparatus, the hardware needed to carry out these functions. And with that, we would also need a, some specific equipment, equipment that would be needed in order to ensure that this digitalization precautions could be taken. And therefore, because of the requirements of economics and the requirements of equipment 
we would have to see what is the priority, what, how to prioritize digitalization in this aspect. And therefore one has governments, politicians, we heard about what are the politicians' views on this. Politicians would have to see what is the priority. For example, at the moment, uh, the European Commission has decided that the priority is mainly for prescription medicines only. And if it comes, it, the non-prescription medicines would be a second priority. We also would re require training. Training that is probably universal in anything that we do. Education, education, and more education would be required. Education of the policymakers of how important it is to have digitalization in this process of ensuring the fight against substandard and falsified medicines, but also education of the people who use the systems and education of probably the public why they should obtain their medicines, their products through regulated areas. And one of the convincing factors for them to do this is the provision of these actions against substandard and falsified medicines. But some important point that sometimes it's not so commonly mentioned is the question of accessibility. Because I have heard, for example, that now that is the product that we have available. Better give a substandard product to a patient than not give him anything at all. And this argument of accessibility, although it may not at times look to be or assumed to be so logical and would immediately be labeled as illogical, in fact, it's an argument that in, the, in society, especially in societies which are deprived of having accessibility to medicines, they would tend to ignore these digital developments and put priority to having an access to a product and then to put the priority that that product is not substandard or falsified. And so this is something that will gather together the need for the education and training in, in, this, in this field. Having a looked at these uh, barriers and challenges and hopefully ho coming uh, to, to the last slide that uh, I have today is the question of what enables the use of digitalization. And what enables the contribution of digitalization is the fact that people are now becoming more aware of the hazards that are met through falsified medicines. And therefore, it is our duty as pharmacists and their contribution to society to make sure that people know, are aware of the existence, even today, at this time that I am talking, we could say that there are a number of falsified medicines going around. And because that is an enabler, if people are aware of the hazard of falsified medicines, then the policymakers would be more inclined to enable the use of digitalization to avoid these problems. Another enabler is today that we have aligned technology, technology to ensure the stability, for example, markers that could be used to, to determine the temperature during transport, the temperature recording during storage conditions. And therefore, that fact that we will ensure the stability of the products has been determined through technological records, through records that are obtained through digitalization, will help will assist to ensure that that product is not substandard. Because a product could leave the manufacturer in a legal way. 
in a tested way, but could become substandard by, from, with the way that it carries in the transport from the manufacturer until it reaches, it reaches the user. But even when it reaches the user, the pharmacist could, may need to educate the user to ensure that the standard has not left the pharmacy, do this, the, the, that the product has not left the pharmacy during dispensing in a good quality way. And when it is stored by the patient themselves, it's, it's, it will turn into a substandard product. We have drivers to help us with this and legalization may, may be a challenge, but could also serve so that one would ensure it could be a driver to ensure because people are usually uh, are usually people who would like to stick to rules and regulations and therefore legalizing having this in our legislation that one needs to ensure this fight against substandard and falsified medicines would help as a driver then testing testing in, through our through OMCL labs, the various testing would also help as a quality control to ensure that substandard and falsified medicines are not on the market. And finally, but certainly not the least important is that we need to introduce in our curriculum, this question of digitalization. First of all, a question of digitalization in general, we need to introduce in our curriculum, but also we need to introduce in our pharmacy curricula, the need and the ways how to fight substandard and falsified medicines as an integral part of the pharmacy curriculum. And with that, I would like to thank, thank you all for bearing with me these few minutes on uh, on digit on the fight to substandard and falsified medicines through the process of digitalization. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony, for that uh, very erudite uh, trawl through those big issues about uh, the whole thing. I'm going to uh, move us on. I've got an eye on the time. Uh, I don't want to overrun because um, FIP will, um, and in particular Farah will punish me severely if we overrun. So my career is now at stake, everybody, um, on the timing, but it is with super great pleasure that I'm able to introduce uh, moving from Malta towards the east and slightly north to Romania. I think we have Christina Pavel from the uh, Ethica Independent Pharmacists Association, who is president of this leadership body in Romania. Christina, thank you very much for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will try to be as short as possible, <clears throat> considering the time. So I'm going to enter the subject quite quickly. Uh, as I'm going to talk about the ongoing initiatives that are uh, being uh, put in place in Romania uh, when we talk about the fight against, uh, against substandard and falsified medicines. So on one hand, we have the process of serialization that Professor Anthony uh, started to talk about. Um, what is this about? It's, uh, we had a European directive that I think it is implemented in most of your countries, and it began to be implemented in Romania as well, starting with the uh, uh, year 2019. Um, we have a, a Romanian national body, which is the Romanian Medicine Serialization Organization that takes care of the implementation of all the process. Um, and helps us with all the uh, we have to do with, with this. So uh, mainly what is it about? It's, uh, it's about uh, having inscripted uh, all the boxes of medicine under uh, prescripted uh, 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 system um, with a Q, 2D QR code. Uh, that we have to scan, we have to transmit data through a, through a, to a national uh, verification medicine system, 
uh, from which we get response if everything is okay with the box of medicine we dispense to the, with the, to the patient, or if uh, not, we get some alerts to to uh, verify of or if anything happens. Up to this point, we don't know. Uh, we don't have responses of being uh, having to to uh, be uh, to deal with problems regarding uh, falsified medicine through Romanian uh, pharmacies. Um, um, up to this moment, um, I think 100% of Romanian pharmacies are involved in th this process, but in uh, different uh, percentage of, uh, of uh, decommissioning the, the medicines, because uh, of course we have many challenges with this process. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, one of them uh, I would uh, mention among them i would mention uh the the fact that uh, it's a uh, it's a process uh, the we, we have an um, informatic platform that belongs to the health insurance house insurance house that is the interface from uh, the software of the pharmacies to the uh, national verification system and sometimes it collapses and uh, just one thing that has been brought to my attention but why one of my colleagues yesterday that uh, pharmacies that uh, have to dispense bigger amount of quantities of, uh, of uh, medicines to centers for a person with disabilities or for a center that takes care of uh, uh, older people uh, so they have to dispense uh, uh, quantities of, of medicines uh, have a problem with uh, scanning each box uh, and also it uh, uh, blocks the system as well because it requires uh, um, some um, time for each box to be scanned and to send data to the uh, national system. But despite all this, we're making each day uh, and we're collaborating with the, the national body that uh, implements this serialization in Romania to improve and to better implement uh, uh, this process um, for fighting against the falsified and substandard medicines in Romania. And to be sure that we supply safe medicine for our patients. Uh, one of our, our um, one of other um, Concepts implemented in Romania, as it was, uh, it has been done in most of uh, you, not only you country, but worldwide countries, is the online pharmacy. It's a box of, it's a Pandora's box that was opened with benefits for the patient and pharmacies. But um, one concept that we uh, constantly puts us problems because, uh, as we all know, most of the falsified medicine medicines are sold through online platform. And uh, this is a, a, an important issue to, to regulate and to uh, monitor uh, from all the authorities in, involved. So in Romania also in 2019, if the, after the legislation was approved, um, it was possible to open online pharmacies. Uh, and despite the, uh, lobby, the intense lobby for um, online uh, network and sellers uh, for having a relaxed legislation, the Minister of Health kept his its uh, opinion and it introduced some uh, um, strict uh, regulation for, for this uh, uh, field. Uh, so for this in Romania, to have an online pharmacy, you have first to have a physical pharmacy. Uh, you have to have a website that, that uh, fa facilitates um, the conversation be between the pharmacist and the patient. You have to have a, a specific space destined to this activity, a specific pharmacist uh, that takes care of this activity. You have to have on the website a questionnaire where the patient puts some data uh, regarding uh, age, sex, uh, uh, current treatment, uh, allergy history, or pregnancy, or uh, breastfeeding status. Um, uh, also, what is very important is, is this: uh, uh, for online pharmacies, there is uh, a different authorization process, uh, even though it uh, they are owned by uh, um, already existing uh, authorized pharmacies, physical pharmacies. Um, also, the website, as you see on, on the slide, has a logo 
uh, on which you can click on to see if uh, there is an authorized pharmacy. And on the website of the Ministry of Health, uh, there is also a list with the authorized pharmacies. So uh, these are the ways, the main ways uh, um, through regulations um, by which the Ministry of Health uh, tries to control and to organize uh, the selling of the medicines online. Um, I think we can move on. These are the main, uh, okay, uh, concepts applied in Romania. And regarding the barriers and challenging, there, uh, here, here we can talk about more. Uh, I think the first and important one is the lack of human resources, institutional level for implementing and monitoring activities. It's the lack of fund for digital solution as the government does not uh, consider it a priority the lack of uh, digital competency when we talk about older people that are chronic uh, medicine users uh, and uh, this uh, does not let them use easily the digital tools when we talk about uh, digital instruments but on the other hand that can be a good point because they are not so much exposed to falsify medicine that as i mentioned before are sold on internet and on online platforms um, I think uh, another important issue is that the patient and the patient organization do not understand, fully understand uh, the threat and the risk uh, falsified and substandard medicine posed to, the, to their uh, safety, and therefore they do not use, uh, they do not pressure too much on uh, a state institution to find instruments to solve this problem. Uh, also, a um, lower level of health education might be the problem and uh, the lack of uh, uh, school uh, uh, programs in educa health education where pharmacies could play an important role are uh, as well as a prof uh, problem. Uh, but also the constant lobby uh, that um, uh, network uh, online sellers network put on um, Romanian uh, authorities are a constant threat to all this uh, regulated process. And of course, another important issue is that the uh, uh, producers are trying to authorize more and more their products uh, um, as um, food supplements that can be sold, uh, sold in uh, all kinds of, of stores. Uh, in terms of, uh, we can move next, in terms of um, drivers and en enablers, uh, I would mention very quickly a few, uh, but I think the most important is uh, finding fonts uh, and accessing EU fonts or other external fonts to develop uh, digital tools and to prevent uh, um, in order to help mostly patients to, to uh, identify and to be aware of uh, what uh, this uh, falsified of SARS substandard men medicine uh, can uh, um, signify uh, as a risk to their health. Um, also, uh, the, a bigger involvement of uh, the organism that implements the serialization in Romania could make a difference in how the patient relates to falsified medicine. Uh, educational campaign through pharmacies, media spots, national ports, spot, uh, posts, or using online social network for promoting messages relating to medicine serialization, online pharmacy, and the threat that substandard and falsified medicine poses should be a priority for the authorities in partnership with the uh, organization from the pharmaceutical field and patient organization. I think the most important field uh, thing now is to get out of the pharmacy for the focus of the authorities to be out of the pharmacies because in, in pharmacies with the serialization and all, all, the, all others control processes, uh, medicine are, are, quite, are quite well controlled. But um, what happened outside the pharmacies is a really big concern and therefore uh, the focus of the government should be outside the pharmacy uh, to develop tools to educate patients uh, how to identify false medicine how to identify online pharmacies authorized pharmacy and also to raise 
trust among the pharmacies as to be the first one to address when they need medicines. And last but not least, one of the most important things which we consider is implementing and remunerating pharmaceutical services. Uh, because by this, we can motivate and determinate pharmacists to play a more active role in educating people and in developing instruments that can fight against substandard and falsified medicines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, uh, for that presentation. Can I remind everyone, if you'd like to ask questions, please put them up on the chat line and Christina uh, and Anthony will be able to. Uh, answer them. I'm still looking at the clock. I'm still worried about the future of my career with FIP. So I'm now looking towards Jana Smegberg, up back up north to Norway. So um, senior advisor, pharmaceutical affairs for the Norwegian Association. Thank you very much, Jana. The floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to share with you how we utilize digital health technology to fight falsified medicines in Norway. We are not a member of the European Union, but is largely influenced by EU policy, particularly because of the EEA agreement. We therefore have been complying to the EU falsified medicines directive, abbreviated FMD from now on, since the implementation uh, in February 2019. As my colleague Annalisa shared with you earlier, all Norwegian pharmacies uses the same back-end IT solution system called IKE, developed by the Norwegian Pharmacy Association. This means that the NMVS and hence the European hub only speaks to one IT system representing all Norwegian pharmacies. In addition to the pharmacy system, we also have developed what we call the FMD web client, which is a web-based client that enables pharmacies to perform FMD tasks that are not integrated in the pharmacy system. This FMD web client is also sold to, for instance, Norwegian hospitals to help them comply with the FMD. Next slide, please. Norway have complied to FMD with some exceptions since the beginning and as of February this year we comply fully and have reached an alert rate of 0.02%. We believe the re reason for uh, this success is the support pack we provide for the pharmacies in collaboration with the pharmacies themselves and the NMVS. Firstly, we develop, uh, developed a one-page national standard that states how all pharmacies must organize their dispensing process to comply with FMD. Based on this national standard, we have developed procedures for all the manual and technical points of action the pharmacy staff needs to take to comply with FMD. Secondly, the NMVS provides a single point of contact that the pharmacies can ask for help. Uh, when, for instance, products are placed in quarantine. Thirdly, the IT systems in place in Norway, uh, as IC, streamlines the verification and decommissioning process for the pharmacy staff as a natural part of the normal dispensing process. And finally, everybody works together continuously with development and quality improvement. Next slide, please. In our opinion, the main barriers or challenges to comply with the directive are presented on this slide, and I will go through them briefly. Firstly, the overall technical and quality standards, such as data ownership and access, have been agreed by the stakeholders in the EMVS based on mutually endorsed principles that are compatible with the FMD requirements. The Norwegian pharmacies hence trust that no actor in the verification and decommission chain get access to information about individual pharmacies or patients. But we already see initiatives challenging these principles. For instance, the proposal that the EMVS should be applied for other purposes than the prevention of the distribution of falsified medicines, such as tracking of products in relation to medicine shortages. We are afraid that such proposals of new purposes, although may be made with the best intentions, may in the end dilute the main purpose of the FMD and subsequently allow for the use of data that was not intended by the data owners, such as the pharmacies. 
There's also always a question of who should pay for the development and operation of new digital health interventions. The FMD initiative came from the industry, was made mandatory by the EU, and all actors was held responsible to comply, but with no funding following this requirement. In Norway, the pharmacies have had no co-payment by the government either and have therefore developed and are currently operating the IT systems fully by themselves. We all know how expensive developing and operating IT systems are and therefore lack of funding may prohibit further development. Thirdly, it is very important that new digital health interventions are developed so that they support the pharmacy staff in their day-to-day -day work. As I mentioned earlier, we have made great effort to streamline the verification and decommissioning process for the pharmacy staff as a natural part of the normal dispensing process. But we did not succeed in all aspects, and that is why we also needed to develop the FMD web client to support every technical point of action the pharmacy staff needs to take to comply with FMD. Lastly, it's always a question of what's in it for me. Of course, Norwegian pharmacies want to contribute to the prevention of the sale of falsified medicines by complying to the FMD. But for so large scale new digital health interventions as the FMD has led to, including self-financing the development and operation of new IT systems, the pharmacies need to be sure that it is working. Do the FMD contribute to less falsified medicines and greater patient safety? Because if it isn't so, then the vast amount of human resources the resource hours and finances may not be according to the output. Next slide, please. And then we have the enablers and drivers, the reasons why we can and want to comply with the FMD. There were two great enablers already in place in Norway at the time we learned about the FMD, and that this meant that we had to develop IT systems supporting FMD by 2019. First, the fact that we were working on another large-scale IT development at the time, the joint backend solution Ike. We therefore, right from the start, had experience in human resources at hand that could start the development. Second, we also were able to finance this development ourselves and therefore did not have to spend valuable time searching for finances while not being able to start a development and prepare for implementation. The first and foremost driver to integrate and mobilize the digital health interventions needed to comply with FMD is attempting to make sure patients in Norway are provided safe and effective medicines. Secondly, being a part of this European initiative alongside our neighbors is a great motivator. And it is a driver to comply the best we can to EU regulations as we are a part of the EEA agreement. This was my final slide, and I hope I was able to share with you how we utilize digital health technology to fight falsified medicines in Norway, and what are the barriers, challenges, enablers, and drivers in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jana. You did indeed accomplish all of those things. That was a super presentation. Uh, thank you for your patience in uh, delivering it, but it was well worth it. Thank you so much indeed. Um, I think it's fitting that we finish off and uh, for our audience, we are going to be uh, uh, five minutes late. I do apologize. Um, it's the end of my career, I fear, but nonetheless, it's been a super informative webinar. But to go back to Brussels and Ilaria and to get an overview of the European situation with substandard and falsified medicines and to hear what the president, uh, sorry, Secretary General of PGEU uh, has to uh, offer us in terms of this um, topic. Over to you, uh, Ilaria. Yes, thank you. Uh, conscious about the time, I can um, briefly complement what uh, Jan and Christina said uh, from a European perspective. Uh, because PGU is one of the founders of EMBO, the European Medicines Verification Organization, and I'm a vice president of the organization. So I would just like to provide colleagues also from outside Europe some additional element to explain how the system works. And in particular, I would like to stress that this is a, a unique experiment because for the first time, the EU legislation has mandated the stakeholders, so the stakeholders of the pharmaceutical supply chain, to implement a piece of legislation, so to put in place the system, to finance the system, and to, to guarantee that it's uh, implemented across Europe. 
it's a unique experiment because it's a huge, large IT database that uh, merge uh, all the national database in a central European medicine verification system. The, 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 I, I will make the, the, the slides available for you to see uh, how the system works from a technical point of view. Uh, I would like to stress that it's uh, it's very expensive, uh, especially for marketing authorization holder. We're paying for the infrastructure, but it also generated a lot of uh, it, it generated a big impact in the pharmacy practice because also from the pharmacy side there was uh, investment needed to upgrade uh, the pharmacy software, and it is going to also to disrupt in a way pharmacy practice because the medicines that generate an alert cannot be dispensed. And so there is a reverse logistic element that is cumbersome for pharmacists. Um, and uh, in relation to the data access, uh, indeed the system is used, is the, the purpose is to uh, prevent falsified medicines to enter into the market, but this large database also contains very sensitive information and can be used and abused uh, for anti-competitive practices. And that's why uh, we are there as PGU, as in Envo, to defend uh, the principle of data ownership and to be sure that pharmacy data remain uh, within uh, the pharmacy sector. Uh, the implementation of this piece of legislation is very complex. Uh, it was adopted by the European Union in 2011. We are 2022 and it's still not fully implemented. There are some countries uh, which, where pharmacies are not fully connected. There is still a, a number of alerts which is concerning for the, for the reasons I mentioned before, so for, especially for reverse logistics. And uh, we also always uh, uh, discuss with our members uh, the, you know, the, the impact it has in relation to the investment that is, it has generated. So uh, this large infrastructure is preventing the entry of falsified medicines into the legal supply chain, into the traditional supply chain, but there is uh, there are online sales, which we know are one of the main source of counterfeit medicines, which are not covered in a way from this piece of legislation. Um, and so we this uh, the implementation of the falsified medicine legislation. It's uh, on top of the agenda of all PTU meetings, and the the concerns and the points that Jane and Christina shared are uh, common and shared by all uh, PGU members. Thank you very much, uh, Ilara, for doing that. That that was. Um, uh, can you, uh, perhaps, tell us uh, very very briefly as we finish off this uh, webinar today uh, uh, about the future from your perspective as Secretary General of PGEU? Do you think we're winning the battle uh, against substandard and falsified medicines? Well, I, I think in the European region, we are uh, lucky in the sense that uh, we, we know that there are not many falsified medicines in the legal supply chain. So as I said, the, the main source is online sales. And the, the future is, um, is difficult to predict, uh, but as, at PGU, we are firm in defending one principle that all the um, obligations uh, that apply to the offline sales of medicines should also apply online and that should be a common level playing field between brick and mortar pharmacies and online pharmacies. Uh, there is EU legislation which is currently being discussed which is going to have an impact also on the online sales of medicines and we will, we will have to be vigilant to ensure that uh, the, the supply chain in Europe remains safe and we also have to continue uh, making efforts to uh, implement this uh, very complex piece of legislation uh, because we are not there yet. So the system is, uh, is still not uh, perfect and we have to help also pharmacies to, to, to comply and also assure that medicines which generate an alert then don't cause uh, additional problems in relation to shortages because they cannot be dispensed when in fact maybe there is no, no problem with them. So these are I see as the main challenges I see for the um, problem of falsified medicines in Europe. Super good. That was exemplary. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was uh, a great seminar, I think. Thank you to all of you who presented and participated in the panel. Thank you to, the, to our audience today who asked 
asked a, a lot of really uh, in interesting questions about this. We are going to gather it all together. We are going to gather our uh, panelists and presenters um, advice and comments all together into a for a preparation for a global round table that will be held later on this year. Nothing will be lost from today. It will all be captured. It will all be used. It will all be fed back for us to learn uh, from these experiences. Um, so can I ask our audience who have valiantly stayed with us, even though I've completely failed in keeping uh, to the time of this uh, webinar, to uh, uh, show your appreciation to our panelists and speakers, please. There is a little applause button, I think, that we can all uh, hit. Thank you all very much. Uh, it was valuable. It will be used. It will move us as a profession forward. So uh, goodbye, everybody. Good night, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Professor, for conducting this meeting. Just some closing remarks from my side. Uh, we are excited to invite you all to the 80th FIP World Congress of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences in Digital Spain. Uh, the Congress will take place from 18th to 22nd September under the theme Pharmacy United in the Recovering of Healthcare. Registration and abstract submission are already open. For more information, you can check out our website. It's civil2022.fip.org. Uh, you can also see it on the slide. Um, and if you wish to check all future FIP digital events, you can visit events.fip.org. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for attending and see you during next um, events. Goodbye. Bye and thank, thank you. Natalia. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.